I apologize for the lack of videos the last few weeks. It's been very hectic with my wife's recovery, making things, and on top of everything else, uh, one of our crew members got married. So, congratulations to Austin. We're finally becoming an honest man. It was a fun wedding, by the way. Just putting that out there. If you ever want a good wedding, invite all your nerd friends, because it's it, it's fun. So we left off with Henry Every and the crew of the Fancy making their escape. At some point during the trip, they ran into Joseph Farrow, the Portsmouth Adventure, who had suffered a shipwreck. He and several of his crew were rescued. A few others chose not to. Once the crew of the Fancy made it to Reunion, at that time known as Bourbon, it's off the coast of Madagascar. It was settled by the French. Originally, it was settled by French mutineers, and then they decided, then the French East India Company decided to actually have a permanent settlement on the island itself. The shares amounted to a thousand pounds per man plus gems. I have never seen an estimate on the gems. So, a thousand pounds in 1695 is now worth roughly 170,000 pounds today or $209, $209,000. Given the amounts of bribes that were paid, given that the crews would actually have to pay for cost of living, pay for transport, I'm guessing the gems might have added maybe another. 500 to possibly more to those shares. At this point, the Danes and the French decided to stay on Reunion. I know I'm probably pronouncing the French wrong. I'm French is not my language. The crew decided, after much discussion, that their goal would be to reach the Bahamas. Before they left Reunion, they purchased 90 slaves. They would work on the ship, but this was also a form of money laundering. A lot of the coinage that they would have had in their possession would have been Mughal coins. It would have marked them immediately. They wanted to get rid of that money as soon as possible and convert it to other currencies, other forms of payment. In this case, they decided to use enslaved people. Part of the way across, they stopped at Ascension, which is, looking at the maps, it's about as middle of nowhere as you can get. It was uninhabited at the time. They caught 50 sea turtles. Crews would periodically stop by this island for the birds and for the turtles. It was later the site of the sinking of the HMS Roebuck in 1701. That was under the command of Dampier. Yes, Dampier has entered the story slightly. It was not settled officially until 1815, and that was largely due to the nearby island of St. Helena holding a certain Frenchman by the name of Napoleon. I know he's Corsican. I apologize. Seventeen men chose to stay behind on this barren island. Now, keep in mind, they did not careen the fancy since they attacked the Ganji Sawai. So, would the ship have been leaking? Would it have, would the crews have been a little paranoid? Yeah, more than likely. This would have, it wouldn't really be so much in hurricane season at this point, but there were still storms. In March 1696, the Fancy anchored off Eleuthera which is about 50 miles from Nassau. Four men took a small boat to Nassau with a letter to Sir Nicholas Trott, the island's governor. 
They described the crew as 113 interlopers that had just traveled from Africa. They technically weren't lying. Trot would receive 860 pounds, which in today's money is 133,000 pounds or $163,000, plus the fancy which would also include the guns and any cargo that they couldn't necessarily carry on their person. Now, 860 pounds does not sound like a lot. And honestly, to some of the more successful colonies, for those governors, it probably wouldn't even sound, sound like a lot either. Trot at this point was only making 300 pounds per year. So in pounds today it would be 46,000 pounds and in today's American currency it would be $57,000. For a governor, especially one on an isolated island in the middle of the Nine Years War who's tasked with defending the island from the French, that's not a lot of money. <laughs> I mean, there's probably quite a few of my viewership who definitely makes within this realm. I, it's middle class depending where you live. The letter was signed by Henry Bridgman. Now, Trot, he, he liked the potential here, so he took this to the council. His argument would be that they did not have enough people to defend the island from the French. Here are 113 men. It would more than double the population. Plus, there were cannon. Nassau only had 28 cannon defending it. I say only, but we're talking about ships that could have upwards of 100 guns. In this case, like the population wasn't even enough to properly man the cannon. There were only about 70 men on that island. There was some, there was some fear, like, mate, what if they turn on us and take it over? They decided to take the risk. Council agreed. They were allowed to sail in. It's unclear if Trot ever told the council about the bribe. Trot would receive 50 tons of ivory tusk on top of the, 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 the bribe, plus 100 pounds of gunpowder, the guns of the ship, and several anchors. Now, some of the authors who've covered this, they talk about, well, he had, they had a lot of foreign coins. The colonies in general had a lot of foreign coins at this point in time. It, because of some of the restrictions by England on the colonies, it would not be uncommon to have foreign coins in your possession. Would it have raised red flags depending on who was in charge of customs? Oh, definitely. But for your average person, it would be, okay, how much does it weigh? All right. We'll take it. The ship ended up being stripped and scuttled. So there may be pieces of wood somewhere in Nassau today that came from the fancy. Don't, like, don't go down and start looking for treasure because they took it all. The crew lived on the island for several months until June 1696. By this point in time, it's very likely Trot and everybody else had gotten word of who Henry Every was. Now, keep in mind, this the proclamation was dated August of 1696. So, the proclamation came a little bit later. But there would have already been what we would think of today as like a police blotter. Like, hey, we're on the lookout for this suspect. Goes by the name of Henry Every, alias Bridgman. They already knew some of his aliases, even at this point in time. Already, from pretty much the time he had taken the Charles II until this moment, there would have been words circling throughout the English sphere of influence. Uh, I've known several, I've seen several videos, I've even replied to them, where there's they talk about, well, Kidd was the first one. No, no, Henry Every was the first one where they had this level of media. D.R. Burgess wrote an excellent article covering how 
print media and how word of mouth spread the story extremely fast. I mean, we're, even though this is before electronics, before television, before social media, a lot of these mariners were very well connected. They knew how to spread information. People in the colonies would have known about Henry Every taking the Charles II probably within a matter of a few months, if not shorter. At this point, the crew split up. 20 of, 20 of them were on the Seaflower, headed back for Great Britain. The Seaflower was placed under the command of Joseph Farrell. At least 75 of the crew ended up in North America. They ended up in the Carolinas, New England, and of course, Pennsylvania. Seven were captured in North America, all were acquitted, with the possible exception of James Brown, who I covered in the Pennsylvania video. He's also the one who married Governor Markham's daughter. I honestly, there, there's so much information covering their activities in the colonies that I wouldn't mind doing a, I'm probably going to do a separate video just on the crew of the fancy in the colonies. There's been quite a bit of metal detectors finding coins that can be dated to around the time of the fancy, Moogle coins, in such places as the Carolinas and New England. Uh, Pennsylvania, periodically, people will find random artifacts that date back to the Moogle era that there really isn't enough provenance to decide where they're actually from. <music> Meanwhile, in India, so at this point, the East India Company, they had already angered Aaron Zeb enough. I mean, to look at the numbers, in 1684, they were making 800,000 pounds per year, which amounts to 124 million pounds today, or 152 million dollars today. And by 1695, they were making 30,000 pounds, or 4,650,000 dollars, pounds, I mean, or 5,700,000 dollars. It doesn't sound like a lot, but we're talking about what at this point would have been one of the major trading companies. They, they lost so much of their value because of their activities against Aranzeb, because of Aranzeb's activities against them. Pretty much no sooner had the Ganji Swai arrived in Surat than did Intimad Khan, who was the governor of Surat, arrested the East India Company. He arrested all the English that were in Surat at the time, and he held them in the factory. They literally chained up the factory. For at least one account of at, at least one of the East India Company officials being caught in the marketplace whenever the news spread, and I, he didn't make it. I'll put it that way. It wasn't. It wasn't too friendly. At this point in time, Kafi Khan, of course, the Mughal historian, he was in Surat. He's been interviewing. He eventually is one of the ones who makes it to Aaron Zeb's court to talk about what happened. Aaron Zeb almost immediately closed four of the East India Company factories. He had to be talked out of bombarding Bombay. The East India Company was forced to pay reparations, and there was also political pressure placed on the Crown and Parliament. See, one of the things that we forget, and one of the reasons why I like to, why I did the introduction for these videos is because there was a we had a lot of the politics we have today in this time period you would have had envoys from the Mughal Empire in London there would have actually been representatives there to speak to government they could watch what was happening on the ground level parliament declared Henry Every hostis to many generous it was one of the first instances of this being used. It would later be used after 
the same concept, the same doctrine of the enemy of all mankind. Everybody who'd be associated with this country, they, they would have a certain obligation that if you found this guy, turn him in. Henry Every and his crew were all excluded from Acts of Grace. At various points, William and later monarchs, they would pass Acts of Grace. That would, oh, if you turn yourself in a certain amount of time, you will be absolved of piracy, you'll be okay. Every was excluded from this. The Board of Trade launched a manhunt, so they would have let all their officials know across the Empire, hey, be on the lookout for this guy, this is what's happening, and they placed a 500-pound bounty on Henry Every himself. So, today's currency, 77,600 pounds, and in American currency, $95,000. No, it's not huge, but if you were somebody who was barely scraping by, which a lot of these sailors, a lot of these, a lot of your people working in the ports, they would have welcomed this money very happily. You've already heard how much governors were making. Even that would have been appealing to them. And again, the Mughal officials, Mughal representatives were in London. They were watching this. The whole world was watching this. Spain, who at this point in time was an English ally, they remembered Francis Drake. They remembered Henry Morgan. Seeing the English, if the English were going to be turn a blind eye to piracy, I mean, this was, this was affecting the English reputation. <music> July 30th, 1696, a certain John Dan Coxon of the Fancy was arrested at the Bull Hotel in Rochester. Essentially, housekeeping at the Bull Hotel decided to be nosy. The chambermaid, while innocently, we'll put this in quotes, moving his things around, noticed that his coat was a little heavier than it should have been. And inside the lining, sewn inside and hidden, were 1,045 pounds, I like how they have the 45, worth of gold sequins and 10 guineas. She turned him in, got, got a reward for it. It would be Dan and Middleton who would agree to be witnesses on behalf of the Crown. Out of the 24 members of the crew who would be captured in England, only six would ever end up in trial. They were Joseph Dawson, who was 39, Edward Forsyth, who was 45, William May, who was 48, William Bishop, who was 20, James Lewis, who was 25, and John Sparks, who was 19. This is at this point in time in 1696, so take away two years and you'll know how old they were during the time of the mutiny. This is important, especially for one of them. On the 19th of October, 1696, the trial began at Old Bailey. Now, when we think about court trials today, major court trials, everybody's trying to watch it. I mean, everybody's, I, I, I think about some of my early memories of like the O.J. Simpson trial. Imagine a courtroom that's open to the air. The Old, Old Bailey was rebuilt in 1674 following the Great Fire of London, which was also following the plague. It was made open air so that it could vent so that people could, there wouldn't be that, there would be a less of a chance of disease spreading. But because it was open air, you could be walking down the street and stop and watch the trial. It would have been noisy. If there was a defendant that you really liked, you could potentially say a few choice words to the jurors and possibly save this defendant. I, I wouldn't even say it, I wouldn't even say it has similarities to modern trials. It had a lot more similarities to what we think of when we watch 
TV. When we watch fictional shows. Like, this is more along the lines of getting angry at an episode of Law & Order than it would have been getting angry at an actual trial. The judges included Sir Charles Hedges, Lieutenant of the High Court of the Admiralty. He had been the Vicar General of the Diocese of Rochester. There was Sir John Holt, Chief Justice of the King's Bench. He famously helped end witch trials in England. There was also Sir George Trebs, Chief Justice of Common Pleas. He had been a lawyer during the Popish Plot, which I mentioned in the Charles II video. He was also a supporter of James Scott, the Duke of Monmouth. Apparently he was forgiven, under, especially under William. One of the star witnesses was David Cray. He was the only officer of the Charles II who did not mutiny. His testimony would seal the fate for May. Uh, this is where we get the one line from May where May allegedly said of him and Every, We were true cocks of the game. And old sportsmen. This is where some of us get the hint that maybe Every and May had been pirates before. There's... There's some question on that. I, when he's saying of the game, are, is he talking about piracy? Is he just talking, is he talking about mutiny? I mean, wouldn't we know about this? Cray goes on to describe meeting with May. May at this point was pleading that he had been sick. He hadn't really participated in anything. He was just kind of there. Cray said, I met with May, the prisoner at the bar. What do you say here, says he. I made him no answer, but went down to my cabin. And he said, God damn you, you deserve to be shot through the head. And he held a pistol to my head. Then I went to my cabin, presently came orders from every, that those that would go ashore should prepare to be gone. Just at the point where they were loading up the lifeboat, or the longboat. And when the captain was got out of bed, who was then very ill, of fever, every came and said, I am a man of fortune and must seek my fortune. This was a key part of, ev of the evidence because some of the crew that of the fancy were trying to say, oh, we didn't know we were going to be pirates. We had no idea about this. We just thought we were just having a change of management might continue what we were supposed to be doing. This was... Yes, they were going to be pirates. The judge advocate of the Admiralty, basically their prosecutor, he reminded the jury that if they found the defendants innocent, this would look awful in the eyes of the rest of the world. I mean, these six men were absolutely pirates. They had absolutely committed piracy. At least one of them had even pled guilty. <laughs> it would cause them to lose trade It and due to losing the East India Company, who even though their worth had dropped, it would, it would lead to the poverty of the nation. Now, Let's reverse just a little bit. So keep in mind, the jury is in the open air. They have London looking at them. More than likely, there would be officials, again, from the Mughal court. There are all sorts of government officials. Like, they had a mob of people who some of them were entirely for the pirates. Others definitely were not. There's been some discussion over whether or not the jurors might have been biased against the Mughals because of their religion. It's worth noting that as late as 1675, Barbary pirates were active against England. In 1640, 
there had actually been a raid on England by the Barbary pirates. This would have been in the memory of many of the people present. People at this time, probably more than people do today, generalized religious beliefs. So there was some opposition to the war against France because they that would mean they were siding with Catholic Spain. But there was talk of why don't we go to war with both of them? They're both Catholic. This is the sort of mentality that would have existed right there. So to some of the jurors, could they have been viewing it as an act of vengeance? Could they have been viewing pirates as folk heroes? It is very tough to say. There's a lot of factors to go into why they made this decision. They found the pirates not guilty. Keep in mind, they were using English common law. English common law is the basis for most of the judicial systems in the former British Empire. That includes the United States. There's such a thing as double jeopardy. You cannot try somebody for the same thing twice. Judges, of course, they, they don't know what to do. They're, here's these six men. They know our pirates. And they have suddenly been found to be not guilty. Instead of releasing them, which would have been the normal practice, they sent them back to Newgate, back to the prison. They couldn't let this happen. I'd love to actually do a longer form video of this trial because there is a lot to go into, even stuff that I'm not covering. And I'm trying to be very, I'm trying to be very concise about this. The judges met and they decide they were going to try them again, this time for the mutiny. Sir Charles Hedges would assemble a new jury and he would speak before them and call the former jury dishonorable. This jury would convict the six members of the crew of the Fancy of mutiny, which was still a capital offense. The six of them were given the chance to plead, to try to get themselves out of the inevitable. May would say, oh, I'm, I was sick the whole time. I just, I just sat around. I, hit, I didn't do anything. I didn't participate in anything. Bishop would claim he was too young to make an intelligent decision. I mean, he would have been about 18 at, that, at the time of the mutiny. It's debatable. I, I could see his point. Dawson, Dawson just, like, no, I did it. I completely did it. They let him go. John Sparks would go on to say that he felt, he did feel guilty. It wasn't for the mutiny. It wasn't for the piracy. As I said in the previous video, he was one of the few who confessed to what happened on the Ganji Salai. And he would go on to say that I justly suffer death for inhumanity. On the 25th of November, 1696, Edward Forsyth, William May, William Bishop, James Lewis, and John Sparks were led from the prison to Wapping. They would have been, it would have been a long procession. It would have included the Admiralty Court who would bring with them a large silver oar. There would be people lining the streets watching, catching a glimpse of the pirates. There were five of them. Those five men would likely have it would have been a loud crowd. It wouldn't have been a solemn affair. People would have been screaming. They would have been cheering. They might have been crying. Among them was Paul Lorraine. He was a copyist for Samuel Pepys, who would later on become the ordinary, the prison chaplain, for a certain William Kidd. The condemned would have their chance to say final words. In John Sparks' case, he, again, he would 
he would be solemn. The noose would be tightened, and they would be executed. This would not be a quick affair. This would be slow. If they were lucky, friends would come out from the crowd and help them on their way. Uh, Black Sails does a pretty decent job with the scene with the execution of Charles Vane. It would have been a very similar event in the case of the five of the crew of the Fancy. There would have likely been a hush over the crowd when it happened and probably cheers eventually. Their bodies would be left in the tide. They would, it would be three high tides. Then they would be cut down and they would be gibbeted. Their body would be basically put in a cage, covered in tar to preserve it, and it would be hung along the Thames. As a warning to other sailors who might get the same idea. It was rather fitting that their story would begin and end right around where the Spanish expedition launched. While researching this, I actually stumbled upon one of the ballads that was written right at this time. So, again, during my criticism of somebody's discussion on Kid, ballads were a very common way to get the news. No, it wouldn't be full of all the accuracy. It would be very poetic, but it would get the point across. You would, there would, during the trial itself, there would be ballad mongers walking amongst the crowd trying to sell them some of these songs, and they'd be written to pop, they'd be associated with popular tunes of the time. So, in this case, this one was set to the tune of Russell's Farewell. Those of you who are looking at pirate music for the time period, Right here's a great example. I have never heard it before. I will probably look it up after this video just to listen to it. But the last verse is, Now farewell to this wicked world and our companions too. From hence we quickly shall be hurled to clear the way for you. For certainly if e'er you come to justice as we are, deserved death will be your doom. Then pirates all take care. Ballads would spread. The news, the newspapers would spread. The proclamation, I mean, the proclamation was printed on August, in August of 1696. By this point in time, it had already arrived at the colonies. All the governors had their hands on it. All the magistrates. They were all on the lookout for the crew of the fancy. Joseph Dan would be pardoned on the 9th of August, 1698. He would actually go on to testify and tell his story at the East India House. He would later become a banker for Coggs and Dan at the sign of King's Head in the Strand, London. The bank failed due to, due to a patron apparently committing fraud, uh, and Dan died in 1722. But the most important member of this story, Henry Every. Joseph Dan provides the last account we have of where Henry Every could possibly have ended up. Now, I, general history of Pyrus, there's, there's different stories with that. Uh, there are quite a few ballads going around, and even plays where supposedly Henry Every had run off to Madagascar and married his Mughal princess. Uh, some said he was penniless in a ditch. Joseph Dan testified that Henry Every went to Scotland and from there was planning to go to Exeter. During Joseph Dan's brief adventure in England before he was arrested, he actually met the wife of quartermaster Henry Adams. At St. Albans. Now, Henry Adams, like a few of the other crew, had actually married women when they were in Nassau. Mrs. Adams 
was the only woman aboard the Sea Flower, the ship commanded by Joseph Farrow that brought everybody to Great Britain. Mrs. Adams was traveling alone. This stagecoach station was northwest of London. It was along the Great North Road, and she was heading north. There are only two places that she could be going, either Yorkshire or Scotland. And she said that she was going to meet Henry Every. Now, my own theories on this. So, I don't think Henry Every died penniless in a ditch. He definitely did not run back to Madagascar. Henry Every was very good at keeping a low profile. And if you think about some of the earlier accounts of his spending when he was in the Navy, he also, did not, he also knew how not to waste money. I frankly believe he probably lived out the rest of his life comfortably. I probably didn't make too many ripples in the world. If he had been that poor and he was among people of that of a similar class, one of them would have turned him in. 500 pounds? Come on. I think he knew how to keep a low profile. I don't think he was squandering his wealth. Uh, quite a few of the crew of the Fancy were picked up because they had tried to, they took their, they took the Mughal coins to jewelers and various others and immediately, well, where'd you get these coins from? Uh, Henry Every didn't do that. Uh, at least one author has even suggested that maybe there was some sort of cover of his quartermaster marrying Mrs. Adams, and that he had actually married Mrs. Adams? Maybe they switched places? <laughs> it's one of those things with history, it's one of those mysteries of history that it's open to a lot of speculation. We know at least one of the stories, there's very little possibility it's true, but then there's, there's a realm of possibility with the others. Hope you enjoyed. If you did, like, share, subscribe, comment. If you hated it, comment. We're trying to get the algorithm moving a lot more. Uh, if you enjoyed it enough, you want to give me money for it, I, I'll include my PayPal stuff underneath. The next video or videos, it's more than likely going to be two or three, are going to be on the Pirates in the Indian Ocean that came after every. I mean, some of them are contemporary at this moment, but uh, there's quite a bit more to discuss. And also the end of the settlement on Madagascar. And of course, I will, I, I hate doing it, but I will have to talk about Kidd. I, I've made my opinions about William Kidd very known. <laughs> But I will do a fair, somewhat fair, discussion of him, especially in how it relates to the wider politics of the time period. So, hope you enjoyed. Have a great day.